Today, I'd like to talk about an electromagnetism problem you, related to continuous charge distributions, specifically finding the electric potential of a continuously charged rod uh, sitting along the x-axis. I suppose I should label the x-axis because I have plans later. Uh, sitting along the x-axis with one end at x equals zero. Uh, this is my plan. And uh, just to give you an idea of what the scenarios we're going to talk about, the rod is not uniformly charged. In this problem, the rod has a linear charge density lambda, which is actually a constant A times x. So there's no charge density at this end. There's essentially no charge over there. But the charge density gets bigger and bigger as we go to the right. So there's a lot of charge on the right-hand side and not very much on the left. That's the scenario here. My question is, what is the electric potential V at a point uh, located at height y, position y at x equals zero, above one end of the rod. I want to know what that electric potential is. And so to do this, we're going to have to do a continuous charge distribution problem. And this is for potential, not for electric field, but uh, a lot of the rules are the same in both cases. And so I'll go through the steps that I always use to solve this kind of problem. Step one is to draw a picture. Yay, we did that. Uh, so step one is done. The second thing you need to do in any continuous charge distribution problem is split your charge into tiny little pieces of charge that we can call dq. dq, in calculus speak, means tiny little bit of q, tiny little bit of charge. If q is charge, the little d in calculus speak means a little bit of, and so we want to find some little bit of charge that is uh, that we can treat as a point charge in this case to add up all those individual points. And you'll see I've actually already shaded in one of those points right here. This is going to be my little charge, my, an example of my little charge, dq. It's just one tiny slice of this thin rod of charge along the x-axis. So the important thing here is that each dq can be labeled by a unique value of x. You always need to have some geometrical coordinate you can integrate over eventually to label that. And so each dq has an associated position x along the rod where it sits. OK, I've done my step one and my step two. Once I've done this dq, one thing I want to do just to illustrate how this dq works, I want to write the dq in terms of geometry, and I, in terms of the geometry of the problem, something about that position x that is my label variable. So uh, I guess that's my step three, is to write the quantity dq in terms of geometry. And in this case, that's really easy. We've been given this linear charge density lambda. And what is a linear charge density? It's saying that's charge per unit length. So if I want to know how much charge is on a tiny little length, how wide is this? Its width is dx. That's the whole point. You probably can't even read that. This, the width of this tiny little thing is dx. It's an infinitesimal little thin little piece, but it is dx. So I can write dq is equal to lambda times dx. That's true for practically any linear charge density problem. For us, that means it's the constant a times x times dx. That is our dq for this problem. And maybe as a warm-up for finding the potential, I can start by calculating the complete, uh, the complete amount of charge. What is the total charge on this entire rod? Well, how do we do that? How do I find out the total charge on this rod? Simple enough, you add it up. So the total charge on the rod we'll call capital Q. That's traditional. Capital Q is the total charge of my rod. And we do it just by summing over all the individual pieces of charge. In continuous calculus language, a sum means an integral. So this is integral of dq. Now, if you're a calculus person, you know immediately that integral of 1 dq is just q. Going from q equals 0 up to the total charge q, we're set. Add up all the little bits of charge. The point of doing this geometrical thing, writing dq in terms of dx, is that we can now write that as an integral of constant a x dx. And since it's in terms of x, we know the limits of integration. 
it goes from x equals 0 to, whoops, forgot to put this in here. This is length L. My rod has length L. 0 to L. This is an easy integral because it's just A is a constant. This is one of the integrals that everyone does when they're first taking a calculus class. This is just 1 half A x squared evaluated from 0 to L, or in other words, 1 half A L squared. So I have an equation now for the total charge Q in my system. Great. Okay, so that, that's how you deal with these little dQs. You just ask a question in terms of those Qs. Well, there's another question we can ask. We can say, what is the electric potential V at this point? And that we also know. We know, again, using a physicist version of calculus here, we know that a tiny little bit of potential due to a tiny little bit of charge, dV, we can treat this exactly like Coulomb's law for a point charge because this little slice of charge here acts like a point. It's infinitely thin in all dimensions. And so dV is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times dQ over R, where R is the distance from the source point to the measurement point. Okay, that raises a question. What is R for us in this picture of ours? Uh, and in our picture, R goes from the source point to the measurement point. And hey, I can see that this is just a right triangle. X squared is this length, Y squared is that length. So this is equal to the constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times dQ. Well, heck, I know what dQ is even. I can write this down in a clever way. dQ is A times X times dX divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared. There we go. That's my dv. And in fact, I've now anticipated what my next step is because the, the next step, or this is step four of the process. Step four in doing a continuous charge distribution problem for potential is to write the tiny contribution to the total potential in terms of dq and the geometry of the problem. And that's what we've done. We've taken the generic Coulomb's law equation for a point charge and we've said, hey, I know what dq is for my particular problem from earlier and I know what r is for my particular problem from my picture. That's why we draw a picture. I know what R is, so I've got this equation. And so once I've got that, the good news is that to find my total potential then, again, physicist's version of calculus says total potential is just the integral of all the little bits of potential. V equals the integral of all the little dVs. And we know what that is now. We know that this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which I'm factoring out because I know it's a constant, integral of, you know what, I can even factor out that A, can't I? Just if I'm factoring out constants, uh, integral of x dx over the square root of x squared plus y squared, going from x equals 0 to x equals L. There we go. We've got an integral. And, okay, at this point, I probably should just say, Go ahead, you guys know how to do integrals. This is actually not a hard integral at all. We'll go ahead and do it just because that'll be nice and clear what's going on. Let, let's evaluate this integral. Uh, it's actually not as bad as you think because I can evaluate this with a simple u substitution. I can say that u equals x squared plus y squared and that means that du is 2x dx. So in other words, with that substitution, my V, I've got my A over 4 pi epsilon naught integral. My numerator, x dx, is just 1 half du. And my denominator, square root of x squared plus y squared, is the square root of u, which I will cleverly write as u to the minus 1 half power, because I know how to do this. And hey, <laughs> it turns out that this thing is exactly the uh, 
And this thing is exactly that u to one half u to the minus one half is exactly the derivative of u to the one half. So this is equal. To, oh, I get need to do my limits. I'll do the. I'll put in the limits in a second. This is equal to a over four pi epsilon naught u to the one half. Limits of integration. That's important. When I changed from x to u, my x equals zero limit turns into a lower limit of y squared, and my x equals l limit turns into l squared plus y squared. So this has to be evaluated from y squared to l squared plus y squared. And hey, I can do that. I just plug in those limits. I get a over 4 pi epsilon naught, there are my constants, times, upper thing, square root of, I'm going to put the y's first because I like my variables to be first, square root of y squared plus l squared minus square root of y squared, I'll call it absolute value of y. One thing to notice about this result is that it's all in terms of the absolute value of y. y squared only depends on absolute value. So that's comforting. It shouldn't matter in this picture whether we're above or below the end for electric potential. Electric potential doesn't depend on which side you're on. It's just about distance. So this is actually a comforting result. All right. So hey, look. I have answered my question right there. We can actually be a little bit sneaky, uh, I guess, <laughs> there, maybe I'll go ahead and close my story. Step five here was do the integral, integral dv. That was my step five, to do the integral dv once I knew what the individual dvs were. But then I find my v, and I'm all set. Now, if you're anything like me, you look at a result like this and you say, oh my word, is that right? Can they, I, I, because I don't know. I don't know what the answer to the problem is supposed to be. And so what I normally do when I have a question, I don't know whether this is right, where can I put this that's not going to be problematic? Um, because this is actually a step that I always include. Step six in my procedure, I want to keep my picture. Let's, uh, let's just erase down here, put it right under, the, right under the picture, see how far we get. Step six is your, check your answer using limits. What do I mean by using limits? Well, my favorite limit of all for any finite charge distribution is to say, if I'm far away, if I'm far away, which means that y is much bigger than the length of the rod, this should look like a point charge. I should be down to just seeing a point charge. If I'm far enough away from this thing, I won't be able to tell that it's a rod and not a chicken or something. So it should just look like a point charge. Let's see what that looks like. If, I, if my y is much bigger than L, if y is much bigger than l, then I want to do a little approximation here. I want to look at this square root. Well, if y is much bigger than l, the first thing I might try to do is say, oh, uh, y is much bigger than l, so I can just ignore the l. So I have the square root of y squared minus absolute value of y. That's zero. I never care about something. I guess it's comforting that it goes to zero when we're infinitely far away. That's comforting. But I want to do one step better. I want to know how quickly does it go to zero. What's the leading non-zero term? So let's look at this. Standard approximation technique. The square root of y squared plus l squared, I want to make it, I, I want to put this into a form where it's got something of the form 1 plus epsilon for some small epsilon, for some small quantity. So if I factor out a factor of y, this becomes, I guess I can call it the absolute value of y times the square root of 1 minus l squared over y squared. And l squared over y squared, or 1 plus, sorry, 1 plus l squared over y squared, as you'll notice, l squared over y squared is, in fact, a, uh, l squared over y squared is, in fact, a very small quantity, because divide both sides by y, and we're going to get 1 is much greater than l over y. It's very small. So we can use a standard approximation. Uh, that I guess maybe I should write this to be suggested as absolute value of y times 1 plus l squared over y squared to the one-half power. 
And this is where we can use the standard binomial approximation, equivalent to a series approximation, a series expansion of this, uh, for small values of that L over Y. 1 plus epsilon to the N is approximately 1 plus N epsilon. So there's a standard approximation saying this is approximately equal to absolute value of Y times 1 plus 1 half L squared over Y squared plus higher order terms. There will be an L to the fourth or Y to the fourth and higher order things. But this is our initial thing. This is our, our leading, leading term. So, all right. Oh, I hate to erase that. I'm going to need my total charge in just a second. So I'm going to continue cutting underneath previous calculations just to squeeze this into my tiny board here. Uh, so I've got this square root written in this approximation. That means that V in this approximation is approximately a, that's not a, a over 4 pi epsilon naught absolute value of y times 1 plus 1 half L squared over y squared minus absolute value of y. You can see immediately that there's this cancellation. The term 1 here cancels out with that minus absolute value of y so this is equal to a over 4 pi epsilon naught times, what do we have? Um, I just have absolute value of y times L squared over y squared. Call it 2y squared because of the 1 half there. That's my, uh, that, that's my approximation for v. Okay, this is getting us kind of somewhere. In fact, it gets us everywhere we need to be because q is 1 half a l squared. And hey, look at what we have written down here. We have a 1 half and an a and an l squared floating around. And so this is exactly equal to, this tells us that v is approximately equal to, and hey, what's the absolute value of y over y squared for real y? It's just 1 over the absolute value of y. So this comes out to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught total charge Q over absolute value of Y. Check mark, yay, because that is Coulomb's law for a point charge, where y, absolute value of Y is the distance away from that and from the point charge that we are. And so this works out exactly the way we want it to. If we're very far away, we're going to check these limits, if we're far away from the rod, it reduces to exactly the Coulomb's law for a point charge. That makes me happy. That makes me think that we've done this right, and we probably have the right answer. There are other limits we could take too, but uh, one of them is probably enough for me. So again, the steps you use to solve a continuous charge distribution problem for potential like this. First, you draw a picture, break up your charge into little pieces, little pieces dq, then write that dq in terms of the geometry, dq in terms of dx in this case. If it were a circular thing, maybe you write dq in terms of d theta. Uh, write your dq in terms of geometry, then write dv in terms of dq. If you're doing an electric field, you could write de vector in terms of dq. Do the integral once you know that, once you've figured out how to write all those things in terms of your variable x. And once you've got an answer, check it using some limits. Always do those last checks because they'll give you insight into the problem and they'll make sure you haven't made any silly mistakes. That's how you do continuous charge distribution problems and I hope it's useful to you.